Now I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Rupinder Kaur. Rupinda is an assistant research professor in the laboratory of Dr. Seth Bordenstein at Penn State University. Rupinda is broadly interested in understanding insect Wolbachia interactions. She has explored the utility of Wolbachia for the control of the insect pest Drosophila suzukii, as well as the antiviral effects some Wolbachia can elicit when transinfected into some insects. She is currently working on understanding the cellular and biochemical mechanisms of the Wolbachia-induced cytoplasmic incompatibility, a holy grail in the field of Wolbachia research. Rupinda, thanks a lot for participating today and for sharing your work. We're really looking forward to hearing about it. And at this point, let me turn the floor over to you. All right. Um, thank you, David and team, for organizing this webinar series and inviting me. I am really grateful for this opportunity to talk about my recent work on mechanism of Wolbachia induced cytoplasmic incompatibility. Um, where, as you can see here, we'll be talking about different players of the story, namely Wolbachia bacteria, where supposedly the phage particles they are released out of the cell which then interact with host sperm and oocytes to manifest various modifications that lead us to understand the cytoplasmic incompatibility phenomena. So last week, Thomas and he did a great job in introducing Wolbachia to the, to the audience. Uh, but just in case uh, folks who might not be there, I'll be giving a little bit of history. Um, so bear with me. Um, so Wolbachia research is also is almost a century old research now. It was back in 1924 when Samuel Wolbach, a Harvard trained pathologist, and Marshall Hurtig, an entomologist, uh, they found these unknown rod shaped looking bacteria in the ovaries of mosquitoes. Back then they didn't know what it is, but uh, it was so it was later named Wolbachia after the name of Dr. Wolbach. So little did they know uh, that the, these bacteria, these unknown back then, um, which were unknown back then, they are going to be so dramatically distributed throughout the group of arthropods um, and nematodes. As you can see here today, we have we know a lot of diversity of insects, uh, be it flies, mosquitoes, butterflies, moths, many different insects, it's spiders or springtails. They are infected with Wolbachia. Uh, and there are some filarial nematodes and some plant nematodes as well, which are known to have Wolbachia infection. So depending on their host, uh, Wolbachia can occur as mutualistic relationship, meaning that Wolbachia and the host, they cannot live without each other. They both not need each other. Uh, they can be reproductive parasitic organisms, which means that Wolbachia uh, deploy the host to uh, induce modifications uh, in its own benefit. Host may survive without Wolbachia, but Wolbachia need the host in this case. Uh, there are some cases like uh, highlighted in gray, gray area here, uh, meaning that the host Wolbachia association is not determined yet. And there are some cases where Wolbachia um, have phage particles in, in its genome integrated, um, which the details of what I will be getting in a minute too. Okay, so as I said, Wolbachia can occur as reproductive parasitic organisms in the insects uh, to do various manipulations. Uh, here is a Drosophila ovary that you're looking at, which is heavily infested with Wolbachia um, cells, uh, highlighted in red here, uh, which occur in the cytoplasm uh, of each of these ovarials. So you can appreciate how infested this ovary is. So this is how Wolbachia can actually hijack the reproductive system of the host. Uh, to do various kinds of manipulations. And the manipulation that we are interested in in the, in the lab is the cytoplasmic incompatibility. Um, so CI, in, as assured, uh, is being used by Wolbachia for its, as its the greatest weapon. Um, so as the name suggests, um, CI is uh, incompatibility in the cytoplasmic infection status of Wolbachia in the males versus females. So here the cross scheme is if the Wolbachia is not there in the males and in the females, uh, indicated by unfilled symbols, uh, these have no incompatibility. So they will mate happily, they will lead to uh, offsprings that hatch normally. So the progeny has no Wolbachia, but they are normally hatching. Um, then the incompatibility happens between a male that carries Wolbachia, indicated by a filled symbol, 
and mate with a female that does not have ovakia. In this case, this incompatibility leads to embryonic lethality, meaning that no offsprings hatch, uh, the embryos die in the early stages of their development. And this phenomena we call CI. In other cases, when males with Wolbachia mate with females with Wolbachia, they, they mate happily, there's no incompatibility between their infection status, so their progeny uh, is healthy and they inherit Wolbachia from the mother. In the other case, um, when the male is infected and, I'm sorry, I, I should have said, the male is uninfected and when it mates with a female which is uninfected, it's also incompatibility, but since the females have Wolbachia, so that gives advantage to these females to rule out this incompatibility. So the, the offspring, they inherit uh, Wolbachia in them because the females transmit Wolbachia. In the other case, when male, which was the CI causing male, when it mates with uninfected female, in the other case, when it mates the infected female, this female rescued this lethality and the offsprings are healthy and they inherit Wolbachia. So in all these cases, you can appreciate that infected females are at the advantage side uh, because Wolbachia provide a benefit to these females to pass itself to the next generations. And that's how it uses CI as its greatest weapon to spread itself throughout the host populations. Now, when we talk about embryonic lethality at the cytological level, what does that mean? How CI leads to embryonic lethality? What happens that after fertilization, when the paternal sperm uh, fertilize the, the female egg, um, during the first mitotic division at the NFA stage, it is known that the maternal and paternal chromosome in the normal case scenario, when there is no CI happening, they both segregate normally on the opposite poles. Um, so the, the mitotic divisions uh, happen normally and the embryo develops normally. It's a healthy looking embryo here. However, in case of CI, the maternal chromosomes can segregate normally to the opposite poles, but it's the paternal chromosome which uh, is in jeopardy. The paternal chromosome, they fail to uh, condense back and uh, segregate on the opposite poles. So this mislag in the, in the segregation leads to various mitotic failures in the embryonic division cycles. And even if they manage to divide, the nuclei undergo chromatin bridging effect, meaning that they're, these two nuclei, they, they stay together because there is no proper segregation of maternal and paternal chromatin. And these embryos, they fail to develop normally and they die. And this is what we call CI phenomenon. So other than CI, Olbachia has other characteristics such as uh, pathogen blocking. So it was back in 2008 when it was found that the, in Drosophila flies, that if Drosophila did, uh, do not have Wolbachia, then they have a ample uh, uh, amplification of the virus particles. And these viruses, which can be pathogenic in the field, they reduce the host fitness. However, if these flies, they carry Wolbachia, then this Wolbachia can block the replication of these viruses and increase the fitness of the host. So researchers across the field, the, the, the field and the world, they took this phenomena and they tried in the mosquitoes because if Wolbachia has the capability to block these uh, pathogenic viruses, which are RNA viruses, uh, to be to be more, to be not um, they tried this uh, trick, which was to isolate Wolbachia from these flies and transinfect mosquito eggs. Uh, Aedes aegypti eggs. So Aedes aegypti in the field is not known to harbor Wolbachia. So what researchers did, they took the Wolbachia from the flies and transinfected into the eggs. And these eggs then develop into adults that carry Wolbachia into the germline. Um, so, and then they tested this Wolbachia against the replication of different viruses such as dengue and Zika. And they showed that Wolbachia in Aedes aegypti is able to block these um, arbovirus replications. So now combining Wolbachia based CI as a spread mechanism and Wolbachia induced viral blocking phenomena, uh, the researchers across the field, they are using this Wolbachia and CI uh, in terms of vector control programs. So they are using two, dif two different techniques. One could be a population replacement strategy. So what could happen that if the field population of mosquitoes do not carry Wolbachia, you release the mosquitoes that carry Wolbachia and due to CI, they will spread faster 
And since the whole population is now mosquito, uh, Wolbachia infected mosquitoes, they will have the ability to suppress the virus replication. So this is one way to curb down the arbovirus replication. Another technique is incompatible insect technique that um, you release only and only specifically Wolbachia infected males. So these males, um, due to CI, when they will see uninfected female in the wild, they will mate and lead to embryonic lethality, which means you are basically crashing down the population. And these technologies are being used by various organizations, uh, mainly World Mosquito Program, uh, Mosquito Mate in Kentucky, and Verily from California. World Mosquito Program uh, in particular, they have gone um, out and about by releasing a lot of mosquitoes that they rear with Wolpakia, and they released all across the, country, uh, the, the globe. And so for now, they are targeting countries that are infested with dengue viruses, which are more than 10 at the moment, uh, and they are releasing these mosquitoes overall. And over the time of release and monitoring, uh, they have found that dengue cases have been reduced so significantly. Um, in some countries, about 50%. In some, there are even 98% reduction cases. So this technology is being highly successful um, for, for due to Wolbachia uh, World Mosquito Program efforts. So our lab is focused on understanding the CI is wonderful, it's working perfectly, but what is the mechanism of this cytoplasmic incompatibility phenomena? So in our lab, we follow a different uh, combination of genetics, cell and molecular biology, and biochemistry techniques to understand what is going on, how CI happens. So starting with genetics, um, it was back in 2017 where our lab, together with other collaborators, they performed a, a, a large scale of transcriptome and proteome comparison uh, across various Wolbachia strains that had the potential to cause CI and compared it with the Wolbachia strains that do not cause CI. So by comparing this uh, transcriptome and proteome, they get down to a candidate list of two genes um, they called CI factors A and B, short for CIF A and CIF B. And notably, these, uh, these genes, they, they were not strictly belonged to Wolbachia, but to the bacteriophage that was encoded in the Wolbachia genome. So we call them phage proteins, CIF A and CIF B. So to give you a zoom in view, if this is your um, Drosophila host that is infected with Wolbachia cells, so in the Wolbachia genome, you have a phage genome integrated. And in this phage, you have these two genes, CIF A and CIF B, which we will be talking about in, in the next slides. So to understand uh, if these genes that came out as candidates, they are actually causing CI or not, um, they undertook a GAL4 UAS binary system in Drosophila. So these genes that come from Wolbachia encoded phages since Wolbachia cannot be cultured, we could not use transgenic in Wolbachia, uh, but instead they used a Drosophila system and expressing these genes in the Drosophila system. So uh, what is this system for the folks who are not aware? GAL4 is the transcriptional activated protein that is integrated from yeast into Drosophila flies. So these are transgenic flies that express GAL4. And there are other set of transgenic flies that express transgene. It could be CIF gene, it could be any other gene that you want to express. Um, so upstream of this transgene is a UAS sequence. It's called upstream activating sequence, which is a target of GAL4. So this system will only be activated if it's combined with GAL4. So in order to do that, uh, you cross these two flies expressing GAL4 and UAS separately. And in the progeny of these flies where GAL4 and UAS come together, GAL4 then activates UAS, which then activates the transgene expression. And this transgene you can express in the tissue of your own interest. For example, you can combine this GAL4 into, with the promoter um, in a specific tissue that you want to express the genes. Since Wolbachia is a reproductive um, parasite, we express these genes in the reproductive tissues. So with that, uh, now we wanted to test if these genes in the absence of Wolbachia can actually cause the eye or not. So in the males that were previously infected with Wolbachia, we took out Wolbachia and we expressed only these CIF genes to see CI phenomena. Okay, so to first um, 
how you're going to be reading this graph is on the x-axis, we have embryo hatch rate percentage, meaning that how many embryos uh, hatch out of the cross that you are making. On the y-axis is the cross type. So as a positive control, uh, we first tested the wild type CI levels due to wild type Wolbachia. So the male is expressing Wolbachia, but the female is not. In this case, um, the level of embryos hatching is only um, uh, 15%. It's a median level. So meaning that 85% of embryos are on the dying. So this is the example of how CI uh, readout is in these kind of scenarios. Um, and as a control, if this CI can be rescued or not, we cross the males infecting Wolbachia with the females infected Wolbachia. And as you can see, all of the embryos, they hatch. So we have CI and the rescue crosses here. Now, the transgenic scenario, we express CIF A or CIF B in the males and cross them with the uninfected females to see out of these two genes, which is um, causing CI. Surprisingly, none of these genes expression caused CI um, in these cases. It was only when you express these two genes combined in the, in the males that they are able to recapitulate CI. So we have the system where we could uh, cause CI in the absence of Wolbachia, where we need two genes expression in the males, right? Now, what about the rescue genes? What, what out of these two genes can cause rescue? So in the absence of Wolbachia, we expressed CIF A and CIF B from the females to see which out of these two is rescuing CI. Uh, by crossing them with the transgenic CI causing males, we found that it's only CIF A which is causing rescue of CI and CIF B is doing nothing. So basically we have a two by one genetic model where two genes are needed to cause CI and one gene is enough to rescue CI. So to remind you the cytological basis of the embryonic lethality, we have the paternal chromatin, which fails to uh, condense on the opposite poles. So based on this phenomena, and now that we know the genes that cause CI, we asked the question to understand the cellular and molecular aspects of CI, that how do these CIF proteins impact paternal sperm chromatin before fertilization even occurs, that this modified paternal chromatin then can, goes and eventually kill the embryos. So to understand the impact of CIFs on the paternal chromatin, we looked at the host spermatogenesis process. Since we are dealing with Drosophila melanogaster system, so this is how the Drosophila testis looks like, where sperm, sperm development process is a multi-line process. So in Drosophila, a testis is a curly, uh, a curly form. And if you just open it up, make it straight, this is how it's gonna look like. And this is what we do when we need to um, dissect and um, stain them for the morphological and localization purposes. So at the cellular level, the sperm morphological process is starting with the germline stem cells. And these germline stem cells, they undergo rounds of mitosis, giving rise to a set of 16 cells that are spermatogonia. These spermatogonia then grow and develop into spermatocytes. Spermatocytes then undergo my meiosis uh, round of divisions and give rise to a set of 64 haploid sperm genomes, sperm cells. Um, these round shaped sperm cells then undergo elongation stage, meaning that they are starting to form a sperm head and a tail. And after this elongation stage, they undergo individualization process, meaning that their sperm um, nuclear volume is getting reduced, they are getting super condensed and getting mature. And after this process, once they get individualized, they are transferred into an organ which is right next to testes, it's called seminal vesicle. This is where mature sperms are being stored before the male actually mates with the female. Okay, so now that we know how the sperm morphological process occurs, we looked at the CIFS localization. How are they interacting with these uh, spermatogenic stages. So here the host nucleus is, the sperm nuclei are labeled with blue, DAPI, and CIF A is in the green and CIF B is in red. So CIF A, we found that in the apical tip at the germline stem cells, it localized with the nuclei, then it goes into the spermatogonium nucleus, it goes into the spermatocyte nucleus, and co-localized with the round onion spermatid stage until here. 
And after elongation, the CIF A then transferred to the tip of the sperm nuclei. Uh, not in all of the spermatids, but in few of them, meaning that CIF A is getting reduced in abundance and it only goes into some of the sperm nuclei heads. CIF B, on the other hand, we could not detect the localization signals in the germline. However, we started uh, getting signals which were in low abundance than CIF A in early spermatogonium stage, which then gets amplified a lot in the spermatocyte stage, in the round on onion spermatids, and in the canoe stages. The CIF whether CIF A was in some of the uh, elongated nuclei, but CIF B was in the tip of all of the nuclei heads. Now, looking at the needle spermatids, which are super condensed, we could not see signals of either CIF A or CIF B. It was because these nuclei are so condensed in their, um, in their new chromatin organization process that antibodies are not able to penetrate. So in order to see where CIFs are at this stage, we need to decondense these mature sperms, meaning that you are reducing the bond formation in these and you are um, losing their bond um, to, to decondense them. So after decondensation, we found that CIF A was hardly in any of the mature nuclei head. It was mainly on the, on the tails of the sperm nuclei. Um, CIF B was present in all of in the tip of all of the mature sperm heads in here, and it's not in the on the tail. So after that, uh, we also found that CIF A specifically it encodes a bi bipartite nuclear localization signal, meaning that CIF A, which was found, earlier found on the sperm head in the sperm nuclei, if you delete the not bi uh, bipartite nuclear localization signal the CIF A localization into the nucleus is prohibited. It stays outside only. And this NLS sequence was important for both CI and rescue. Uh, we did the CI crosses by expressing the CIF A mutant that does not have NLS. So these females then lose the ability to rescue CI compared to the control CIF A. And when we expressed CIF A, without the NLS together with B, which, which is a CI causing line um, that causes CI. But if you take the NLS, then the CI ability is also inhibited, which means that this NLS sequence is important for nuclear localization of CIF-A as well as um, impacting CI and rescue phenomenon. Now, we know that's the localization and how they interact with the sperm nucleus and when they interact, but what exactly are they doing to modify the paternal chromatin integrity? So in order to understand that, I will need you to take down the, the, the path of sperm genome integrity process, which happens across this stage, uh, canoe and the needle stage. This is the process is called histone to protamine transition. What happens is that before canoe stage, all the DNA is wrapped around histones, almost 100%. But when this stage happens, there is a process which is highly conserved from flies to mosquitoes to even humans that various epigenetic modifications happen to remove the histones from the sperm chromatin, uh, meaning that histones undergo ubiquitination or phosphorylation or acetylation. So these marks, they tag the histones and they come off from the sperm nucleus and then they go degraded. And at that stage, a simultaneous process happens, which, uh, which is DNA damage and repair. So when the, the histones come off the DNA, the DNA becomes loose and it's prone to DNA damage. And the cell knows that I need to repair this process immediately, right? So not to induce mutations or any damage to the sperm chromatin. So this, this process and the modifications, they, they go hand in hand. Um, so if this process does not happen um, properly, sorry, when this happens normally, then the histones, they are replaced with the proteins, which are the sperm binding basic proteins that come instead of the histones and bind on the sperm DNA. So now the, the sperm DNA that had almost all of the histones wrapped around, it is being replaced by 95% of proteins. The proteomines function is to make the sperm active uh, and it's a, to create its a, uh, hydrodynamics for swimming fast and to make it active for fertilization. 
Okay, so if this hap this process doesn't occur normally, then there are many sperm abnormalities that happen that can cause uh, infertility issues and embryonic failure, embryonic developmental failure. So we looked at how cysts impact this stage. So first we checked if histone removal is occurring normally or not in the CI causing males. Uh, with that, we have a control line that does not have Wolbachia or the CIF expression. And we show that these are the uh, positive control for the nuclei heads. Uh, if we have these many canoe heads, uh, these bundles, they, lo they are lost off histones. But in the other crosses where we have Wolbachia presence and transgenic CIF AB expression, we show that these sperm bundles, they are not able to remove histones as regularly as they should have. So after counting how many sperm bundles are retaining histones in Wolbachia infected and CIF AB lines, we found a significant amount of histone bundles, um, sperm bundles that carry histones in the Wolbachia presence and CIF AB expression compared to the negative controls. Then we looked at proramine abundance. Are sperms that are actually retaining the histones, what is happening to the level of proramines? Are they normal or are they decreased? So in order to detect that, we used a chromomycin A3 stain. And this stain is particularly important for uh, calculating proramine abundance because it competes with proramines for the same binding sites of the sperm chromatin. So as an example, if there is um, less proramine, then there is more space for CMA3 to bind, and then it's going to glow intensely compared to the ones that are having enough protamines. So CMA will have less space to bind to the chromatin, so it will glow less intensely. So we tested that in our system, and we show that in the Wolbachia uninfected lines, uh, sperms have less CMA um, uh, fluorescent intensity, meaning that they have enough protamines. And in the presence of Wolbachia and CIF AB transgenic lines, the proteins are less um, because the CMA stain is fluorescing more. So we show that uh, due to Wolbachia uh, or the CIF expression, the protein sperm, mature sperms are protein deficient. And we also quantify the intensity from the individual sperm here. So protein deficiency, is it a causal of CI or is it related to CI? We used to test this phenomena uh, of protamine mutant lines, and we created protamine mutant uh, with Wolbachia and without Wolbachia. And these are our wild type controls here. And we show that the protamine deficiency, because they are mutants, the deficiency even higher. And then we use these lines to, to, uh, to, to relate to the CI levels. So this is our wild type cross where male is infected with Wolbachia. And when it's crossed with uninfected line, it causes only 40% of embryos hatch. Uh, and then when there is protamine mutant line that has Wolbachia and is crossed with uninfected line, the CI levels are accentuated. So now there's only 20% of embryos that hatch. So protamine deficiency is definitely uh, causing CI enhancement. Okay, so the next question, um, now we know that CIF proteins, they invade the sperm nuclei and they interact with them by modifying histone protein transition but are they even biochemically functional? Uh, how do they even manage to act on the sperm DNA to uh, do these changes? So to test that, we first used CIF recombinant proteins and uh, we tested are they functionally active enzymes or not. Um, we incubated these recombinant CIF proteins with the different double uh, DNA substrates. One is single-strand DNA substrate and another is double-stranded. And we found that both CIF A and B, they are able to cleave these DNA substrates. And this is a positive control where no CIFs are incubated, it's only DNA. And as a proof of principle, we also use the same reaction setup in the presence of EDTA. So EDTA is a, a, natu a chelator that, uh, that quenches the cation uh, activity, which is responsible for nucleus action. So if you add EDTA, the nucleus activity will be ablated. And this is a positive control here. Um, interestingly, we also, when we incubated CIF with uh, RNA substrate, it was only CIF A which was able to cleave the RNA. CIF B was not able to cleave it. So that suggests that CIF A is both DNA and RNAs and biochemically active. Uh, CIF B is strictly a DNAs. So this was in vitro. And in situ detection, we looked at this process again. 
we know that DNA damage happens here. So if CEPHs have the capability to cleave DNA substrate in vitro, can they actually cleave sperm DNA in vivo? So we looked at this process, DNA damage, which happens at the canoe stage. And to detect that, we use a tunnel assay. So a tunnel assay, what it does, it detects any single strand or double strand DNA mix in the host. Imagine if this is your sperm DNA that has breaks in it. What will happen, the DUDPs that comes with this assay kit, they will bind to those uh, nicked regions. And due to the enzyme, the reaction is catalyzed and these um, moieties, they are gonna fluoresce. So we detect the fluorescence uh, based on high fluorescence, based on high DNA damage and low fluorescence if there is less DNA damage. So we checked the first the wild type lines. This is the DAPI that is staining the sperm bundles at the canoe stage. In the absence of Wolbachia, remember that it's an endogenous process. DNA damage is going to happen um, to, uh, in order to be repaired and continue with the proteomic deposition. But if this DNA damage is not being repaired on time, then we will see enhanced DNA damage, which is in the presence of Wolbachia. So the, uh, the, the fluorescent intensity in Wolbachia negative males is less. And uh, in the presence of Wolbachia, we see intensity is higher. We also quantified uh, how many bundles have these enhanced DNA damage. And we show that in WML plus, there's a whole lot of sperm bundles that are damaged in comparison to negative WML negative in gray here that have almost um, 0%, most of the bundles that have no DNA damage enhanced. And we recapitulated this phenomena in transgenic flies as well. Um, so with dual CIF-AB expression, which is CI causing male, uh, the DNA damage is enhanced. Uh, comparison to the WML negative. And we also cross this WML negative with NOS uh, genotype to control for the genetic background due to any transgenic impact. Uh, and we show that none of the bundles have enhanced DNA damage or most of them. So based on these findings, uh, we create our host modification model of CI, which are supportive uh, in this system what suggests that during pre-fertilization, what happens to the paternal sperm chromatin, um, cysts that are present in spermatocytes, they can impact the sperm genome integrity by enhancing DNA damage and causing abnormal histone to protein transition. And this modified sperm, which then gets um, uh, mature uh, with protein deficiency, it is then responsible to establish the incipient steps of causing CI uh, post-fertilization. Now we look at this, uh, the mechanism of CI, but what happens to the rescue, how the rescue is happening? So we ask the question, does CIF-A, because CIF-A expression alone is enough to rescue CI. We ask the question if CIF-A, can it interact with maternal host chromatin to modify the maternal uh, chromatin in the same way that it, they do in the paternal chromatin or Regardless of you know, interacting with maternal host chromatin, it may be support the CIFs that in the embryo interact with each other to rescue lethal effects. So in order to show that, we first looked at CIF-A localization dynamics across the Drosophila eugenesis process. Um, so Drosophila eugenesis is also a multi-step process which starts with a region one in the germarium that leads to germ cells and a cystoblast. A cystoblast that undergoes various mitotic divisions to give rise to different egg chamber stages with nurse cells and the oocytes. Nurse cells, they provide nourishment, nutrients um, to, in order to um, uh, nourish the oocytes, which then grows and becomes a mature egg. So we first looked at CFA localization in the ovaries and all these egg chamber stages. And we found that CFA in green, it localizes on the region one of the gemarium which then also overlaps with the germ cell nuclei. And in the early egg chamber stages, it's in the cytoplasm, uh, but interestingly, it's absent in the late egg chamber stages. So CIF-A is only interacting with the host nuclei in the early stages, but it's absent in the late ones. And this absence uh, is also shown in the fertilized embryos, where when the paternal modified sperm comes to fertilize the females, female eggs, uh, and these are the first mitotic division nuclei, uh, labeled with DAPI as a host control. And when we looked at CIF-A, CIF-B, none of these proteins were present in these embryonic fertilized embryos. 
And as a positive control, we used histones that label the, uh, the DNA as well. So the, the positive control worked, but since CIF A and B were absent, uh, we show that none of these CIFs transfer, but they can modify the maternal chromatin um, previous to the fertilization. So this is a model of CI and rescue. As I said, the modified mature sperm with protein deficiency, when it goes to fertilize the females, what may happen is that if the egg is not carrying Wolbachia, then the maternal chromatin is not modified because there's no CIF-A or Wolbachia. But the paternal chromatin that comes with modification, this gets a lag in the sink of uh, segregation of the chromosomes during first mitotic activation. So due to this lag in the, in the sink, what happens that maternal chromosome, which is unmodified, it can segregate um, on the opposite poles, but the paternal one does not. So this cause uh, embryonic lethality. However, if the egg is infected or it comes under CIF-A expression, we hypothesize that the maternal chromatin can be modified in the same way. We don't know the host targets yet, but we are working on it. Uh, and these modifications then get in sync with the paternal chromatin modifications. And due to that, these two paternal and maternal chromosomes can now segregate on the opposite poles at the same time. Uh, which then rescues the uh, lag in the timing and rescues the eye. So with that, now that we know we have SIF genes and we know we have the mechanism, how we keep, is the, the SIF mechanism is applicable to the gene drive and the vector control applications. So we suggest that in a population that has mosquitoes without Wolbachia, these mosquitoes have the ability to transmit viruses like dengue. Uh, in one control strategy, one, what one can do is directly insert the CIF genes into the male mosquito genome. So these CIF genes, uh, when you release the males with incorporated CIFs, they will mate with the wild type uninfected female, resulting in the embryonic lethality and crashing of the local wild population, as we talked before. In other cases where field population of mosquitoes have Wolbachia. So in that case is those Wolbachia can induce CI as we know, by crossing with uninfected females. But over the time, the wild type CI is known to weaken, meaning that not all of the embryos will die. Some are able to even hatch. So in the, in the case of this weakened CI, what we propose is that insert extra copies of CIF genes with Wolbachia. So you have the system where mosquitoes have Wolbachia and you have also extra copies of CIFs. So releasing these males, uh, will cause embryonic lethality and population crash. And also, altogether with males, if you release the females that carry extra CIF genes, these crossings that will lead to rescue, meaning the propagation of mosquitoes in the field population with Wolbachia. So that population will eventually have the uh, reduced com vector competence uh, to, to, to propagate the virus population. So this is how we can use the CIFs in vector control applications. So with that, I would acknowledge uh, all of my lab members, um, Seth Bornstein and Sarah Bornstein, which are the integral part of the team, um, and my host universities, Vanderbilt and Penn State now, and the funding agencies, NIH. And I am open for any questions you may have. So thank you for listening. Thanks a lot, Rupinda. That was really fantastic. And uh, at least from my perspective, there was a lot of new information there that I certainly wasn't aware of. And uh, and I and uh, uh, I think it. Uh, so I'd like to ask you some questions about that. But I'll, I'll get to that shortly. What I'd like to do now is just to open it up for questions from the audience. And uh, let me just say there there are two ways you can ask questions. You can either chat them in using the Zoom function. Uh, which is, and we'll, and we'll get to them when you do that. Or if you'd like, you can actually raise your hand and we'll unmute you and, um, and you can ask your question uh, orally. So let me encourage you to, uh, to do that. Um, in the meantime, uh, while we're waiting for some folks to ask questions, um, let me ask you about something that I think I heard for the first time. And, uh, and you can tell me if I'm, I'm right or wrong, and that is that, uh, that the SIFs have some sort of a nuclease function that you tested. Um, and so that was a, a new piece of information for me. Was that, is, that, is that fairly new, new information? And can you say anything about the nature of that nuclease activity? 
Yes, uh, it's a new information in terms of WML SIFs. Uh, however, there is precedent of SIF nuclease activity in other Wolbachia strains, which have, uh, which are like WPIP or WNO. So there are different Wolbachia strains. Um, so the nuclease activity in those ones have already been shown. I see. Uh, but WML, since um, so the interesting thing is that there are nucleus domains and there are catalytic sites. So those catalytic sites are absent, the known um, catalytic sites, they are absent in WML SIFs. So the question, so it was never being tested, but it was proposed that since there is no catalytic um, triad sites in the WML SIFs, uh, so they are hypothetically um, non-nucleases, but it was ne never shown. So we tested that and now we are working towards the, the active sites to find uh, those ones. We certainly have some indications and that we are working on right now. Uh, but the fact that we have the, the, uh, the in vitro functionality, it, uh, it confirms that they are nucleases. Yeah, so could, could you relate that to, to some of the observations that you're making in terms of the, some of the cellular phenotypes that you're seeing in sperm? How does the nuclease function fit into the CI mechanism uh, that, that you've described? Right, so, um, as I said, the DNA damage response is part of the part of the dynamic, and then there are also many sperm transcripts which are responsible to maintain the sperm genome integrity. So we want to test uh, the sperm DNA uh, nicking activity as well as the RNA nicking activity as well. Um, so far, we did not uh, get promising results in terms of RNA because we didn't have the established um, assay to detect in situ RNA degradation. But with the DNA process, we have been successful. And in terms of relevance, um, if the DNA integrity is being compromised due to unrepaired DNA damage, those, uh, those, those modifications then can lead to downstream effects. For example, paternal genome cannot replicate at the pace and as it should uh, after fertilization. So if it's not able to replicate and it's do doing those um, um, delays in the, in the, in the, in the, uh, in the, um, uh, replication processes uh, in comparison to the maternal one, that leads to a lag in, in, the, in the segregation of paternal chromosome mm -hmm. that causes okay. the mortality. Great, thanks. So we have some questions coming in and I, let me, let me uh, encourage everybody to, to ask questions. There was lots of interesting things that, that uh, Rapinda told us about that uh, it would be great to hear more about and your questions would stimulate some of that discussion. So uh, Nelson Lau, says, is there DNA damage and cutting and mutations in the germ in the germline genomes during CIF A, CIF B expression? Is there DNA damage and cutting and mutation in mutations germline? in the germline in the right. germline genomes during CIF A, CIF B expression? Yes. Yeah, so, um, so when it, when I studied the the DNA damage in the in the testes, so we look at all these different stages from early germline stem cells, then spermatogonia, spermatocytes, canoe. Uh, but no, the tunnel damage is not there in the in the germline stem cells. Uh, it only happens at this specific canoe stage, and this is basically uh, the confirmation of what we know from the literature um, that this happens at only the canoe stage. Um, when uh, there are a couple of cells in the germline which also showed tunnel positive signals, but they were really similar between negative and the positive uh, controls, um, and our test samples, so we did not really consider them. Um, but the effect that is relevant to CI, we only saw in the in the canoe stage. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm going to ask another question before I get to uh, Tom Wolf's question. Um, so the, the the phenotype that you see when you the cytological phenotype that you see was the lack of segregation of of the male paternal chromosomes, and they really appear, you know, just to make, stay at the at the at the uh, at that. Uh, no movement at all towards the spindles. And uh, is that reflected in uh, uh, the lack of uh, centromere functions or lack of kinetochore, you know, uh, assembly, um, no spindle, no, 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 you know, no tubulin um, and spindle fibers attaching. Can you say anything about, about some of the more details about that phenotype? Right. Um, 
So I don't think the kinetic core function or the centromere function has been studied in this uh, Wolbachia, uh, in relation to Wolbachia, but it's very much possible because Wolbachia use actin dynamics and microtubules to, to move and uh, relegate uh, through the cell divisions um, to, to, um, to, do, to go into the cells, daughter cells. Um, so it's possible that it does that. Um, not in my knowledge, it has been studied, uh, but it's, it's possible that Wolbachia can uh, relegate these things. Okay. Did, when you yeah. did any of your cyto cytology, did you actually look at um, do any uh, immunostaining of of spindle uh, of spindles? No, no, not yet. But this yeah. is in the process, and oh, okay. uh, we'll be looking at. But in the embryo, since we were looking specifically at the sifs, and we don't find the sifs, mm -hmm. um, so we don't. That's why the the, the hypothesis is that the sifs need to do something pre fertilization. Uh, to the maternal and the paternal chromatin because that's the only way that uh, CI or rescue will happen. Uh, if you don't see SIFs in the embryo, that means they are not directly affecting these um, mitotic division errors. Mm -hmm. Okay, Tom, I'm going to get to your question right now. Uh, uh, first of all, he says, thanks. Uh, really interesting stuff. Recent evidence in haplodiploid mites and mosquito populations suggests that the level of CI induced by a particular Wolbachia strain depends heavily on the host genetic background. Uh, can your system be used to address some of these questions uh, and uh, the molecular level? In the haplodiploid mites? Yeah, so actually, uh, if you open your chat function there, you can actually see Tom's question, and uh, but I'll read it again. Yeah, um, he was mentioning that in haplodiploid mites and in mosquito populations, it suggests that the level of CI uh, induced by, a, you know, is is background dependent, um, genetic background dependent. Right. And uh, yeah, the question was whether or not your system might be able to be used to uh, to study that. Yes, uh, definitely. Um, you can use that. In, in Drosophila, however, since it's a diploid system, so haplodiploidy function cannot be dissected at this level, not even in mosquitoes because they have the same X, X and XY uh, sex termination system. Uh, but in, in the Nasonia wasp system, we have that model in our lab and it, there's a lot of CI work and Wolbachia work done uh, at, the, at the testes level, at the embryonic level. And they have shown the, the embryonic, the CI embryonic defects like paternal seg chromosome segregation defects uh, and mitotic division defects as well. So it's very much possible to, to use, um, to address these questions. Uh, however, since all the, the, the CIF antibodies that we have, they are very specific to WML and uh, we are trying to use it on different systems, but due to the sequence differences, we have some, uh, negative data that they don't work. So it's it would be, I would encourage to uh, folks to design those uh, antibodies and the, and the proteins based on the sequence specificity to understand mm -hmm. the dynamics of this system in their own uh, different genetic backgrounds. Mm -hmm. So SIF, SIF diverge that much that your antibodies don't recognize these uh, other yeah, they are very divergent in different spots. Yes, they are. Mm -hmm. And then SIFs themselves, they are they are created into five different genetic phylogenetic types. So SIF A type one, type two, type three. Um, so de depending on what Wolbachia strain they are infecting, they are awesome. all different. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, Tom Ant has a question. He said, first of all, he says, nice talk. Uh, if rescue is based on comparative modifications on the maternal chromatin. Uh, how can you explain results showing rescue with CIF A, but CI induction with just CIF B? Uh, okay, so in those cases, um, so if the question is, hold on, how can you explain results showing rescue with CIF A or CI and just CIF? Okay, so there are systems where CIF A is not needed, CIF B alone can cause CI. Uh, in those cases, we, I am not sure if I'm at the liberty of disclosing this information, but there are definitely some models going around depending on the NLS. Um, so for example, if the system has nuclear localization signals, then one SIF or the other does not need the other one. So in those kind of systems, SIF B alone can actually go to the nucleus without the aid of SIF A to induce the modifications. So SIF A does to the paternal chromatin and SIF A does to the maternal one. However, now those modifications are same or not, we don't know yet. Um, we think that modifications can be there to alter their genome integrity, but what ex exactly the targets are, are the same or are they different due to CIF A and B interaction independently? We don't know yet. 
but this is really an amazing question that you know for the field to figure out and we are on that path yeah great uh, uh dr dorrington agoy has a question he says thanks for an excellent presentation uh, could you comment on other techniques that could be used to introduce the Wolbachia to infect uh, Aedes aegypti other than egg injection? Right. Um, you can inject adults directly as well. Huh. Um, so it's, it's possible. Uh, but the eggs, uh, in the eggs itself, it was so successful because it's a germline integration. So you want to propagate Wolbachia from germline to the, to the reproductive organs. So this is the best way to do that. Um, however, adults have, have been uh, transinfected, but not as successfully as the embryonic injections are, so. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, Tom Wolf has a follow-up uh, question. Uh, in natural infection systems, do all Wolbachia cells express CIF A, CIF B at the same level, or is there variation in expression between cells? There is certainly variation. Um, I cannot speak on the natural, all the natural systems because I haven't looked at that yet. Uh, but in the lab, we are working on different systems and we are already seeing difference in abundance, difference in localization. So there is definitely variations in terms of what SIFs we are looking at and in what system we are looking at. Yeah, great. You know, one of the, I mean, there's, there's been a tremendous interest in, in getting to the mechanisms of, of CI for a very long time. And, uh, and before, uh, before people were successful in, in transferring Wolbachia to mosquitoes and, and, uh, and then just using, using the phenotypes that were found associated with uh, mosquito-infected Wolbachia, one of the great interests was in understanding the mechanisms of CI for the purposes of then recreating it as a gene drive system in in other in other uh, in other insects, and so that that uh, we now know a lot about, or you know a lot about uh, the mechanisms of CI now, and so and and I know there's been a little bit of work of transferring these to uh, other insects, but I just like to get your thoughts on what you think the potential is for creating. Um, uh, you know, gene drive like systems or gene drive systems specifically using uh, the molecular components of uh, of, of the cytoplasm of, of Wolbachia. Right. Um, I think the major potential of this understanding the mechanism uh, itself is that we have now get down to these diagnostic markers, for example, histones and proteins, right? Um, we so far we have looked into um, core histones. So insects, humans, they have a set of like four or five different histones, H2As, H2Bs, H3 and H4s. Uh, but if you combinedly looked at them, then it's, it's a core histone, right? So we now know the core histone dynamics is different due to Wolbachia and CIF expression, but uh, what specific histones are there which are retaining? Um, that we don't know yet. And that, that's what we are working on. So once we establish that, then we will have diagnostic markers. So before uh, a strain, before people, scientists will decide to release specific Wolbachia strain in the field, we can actually test that uh, beforehand, what is happening to the histone and proteins. Are there sufficient or above the threshold uh, level uh, modifications that are actually needed to spread it uh, and to integrate in the Wolbachia in, into the host genome uh, based on those modifications? That could be diagnostic. Um, so this mechanistic study can be applied in that way uh, to release mosquitoes. Um, um yeah yeah so i guess my question which is really interesting the fact that you could be potentially have some biomarkers there that would allow you to assess uh a field strains um susceptibility to to ci uh, ahead of time i guess my, my question was more on uh making artificial ci if you will or synthetic cis right. uh using using cif a and b in combinations and in different you know ways that uh, what do you, I just would like to get your idea of what your what you think the potential for that is. I know there's been some efforts to do that by cross, you know, um, with some transgenic Anopheles gambi, with um, you know limited success. But but um, but what are your thoughts? So with the with the SIFs, we can we we can actually it it really for example. So there are what will Bakia strains where. Uh, there are systems where only CIF-B is needed or CIF-A is not needed, right? So I, I think in order to 
apply these things in the field, we need to test what is actually needed, right? Because we don't want to integrate any accessory genes which are not even required in the first place to, um, to have some background impacts on the, on the host genetics. Um, so testing that in the first place would be, would be great and uh, to decide if those strains can be used in the field. Um, does that answer your question, Dave? Yeah, well, I mean, it's, I just want to really with just getting your spec, acting to speculate really about how, how likely it is that we'd be able to make uh, synthetic CI constructs and introduce them into uh, heterologous species for the purposes of, you know, generating gene drive systems that, right. that were, would be unique in the sense they wouldn't be being based on homing based device, uh, mechanisms as CRISPR Cas systems are, for example. Yeah, um, yeah. I think before, yeah, to, uh, in order to actually test that predictability, there are some uh, modeling and simulations that are already going on. And there is a recent paper. Uh, that came on BioArchive yet, it's not published, but it, it says it tests the, the drive system based on one locus versus two locus, uh, homozygous versus heterozygous. So if you need to re release uh, a, only CIF A in the field or CIF B in the field or both combined, and they test the predictability of the, of the, the genetic drive system based on this, these genes. Now, how can we artificially create um, CI, I think in the absence of CIS, we cannot yet think about it. But uh, again, like if we know the host targets, um, then it, it might be a possibility to create artificial systems. Um, yeah. We don't need CIS, we don't need Bobakia, but we can then uh, modify the host targets to, mm. to, to reach that point. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Tom Wolf has a, a, another question. He says, this question is you know, motivated by uh, the background picture on your slides. Uh, CIF A, CIF B are almost always associated with the um, with the WO phage. Is anything known uh, of what induces uh, the phage to go into the lytic phase, which could presumably lead to CI mechanism diversification? Right. Uh, this is an active area of our lab, which is also um, looking into phage lytic cycle um, dynamics. Um, so far, what we know is that um, a phage lytic cycle or phage lysis itself is, um, is, is highly dependent on the temperature induction. So if you induce, uh, if, you, if you incubate your insect host system at a uh, high temperature, that leads to um, uh, phage lysis. So for example, um, yeah, so, so depending on what host system we are working on, if the phage, um, if the phage is lysing at the maximum uh, magnitude, then it can uh, kill Wolbachia cells, right? And it can then impact the CI. Now, integrity of the Wolbachia cell is important to uh, cause CI or not, or is just the phage uh, lysis that can then release CIF proteins is enough to uh, cause CI. Uh, we, we, we still need to test that, um, but the, the potential of inducing different phage lysis uh, can definitely impact CI mechanism or the CI levels, I would say. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to I'm going to ask another question, and I uh, encourage anybody who has further questions to go ahead and ask them because we're um, uh, otherwise we'll we're, we'll get to the end of our our questioning and we'll have to close things out. And I'd like to keep going actually, but um, my question has to do with: Do you think is or is there any evidence that that the CIF genes themselves have played any role in the anti pathogen effects that uh, that uh, that are seen with Wolbachia infections? Yeah, we get this question a lot. Uh, we yeah. are not testing that in, in our lab system, uh, but there are um, evidences that, I think there's only one paper um, where they checked stuff with the uh, SYNV virus. I'm not really sure, so don't take my word on that. But yes, they checked only against one virus um, replication and they found that they are not, CIFs are not impacting the virus replication. Yeah. So it's really uh, concentrated on the, the CI mechanism, uh, but yeah. not virus pathogen blocking phenotype. But again, there are precedents where Wolbachia not always uh, block virus replication. There are one or two exceptions where it can actually enhance virus replication, right? So uh, again, like it's not a, a, a unidirectional phenotype where Wolbachia is always going to reduce virus replication. So in order to test that, we need sure. to test different virus systems against CEFs as well. 
Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, one final question for me has to do with whether or not the, the psychological observations that you've made, in, again, in terms of these mitotic, or uh, I guess there were mitotic de defects in segregation, uh, have been seen in other, if you see this in other uh, uh, insects that, that, uh, that have CI. Right, yes. A lot you of do. different systems they have been so seen. So you see the same sort of sperm sperm defects like that at, at, during the spermatogenesis? No, uh, no, no, no. Uh, so if you're talking about a paternal segregation defect that happens post-fertilization, that has mm -hmm. been seen in many other insect systems. Okay. Uh, but the sperm defects that we are seeing, it, it's, it's a very recent work that we have only because you needed SIF antibodies, you needed SIF uh, uh, detection markers, right? So they have been developed only now with, from our group, and there is another group in, in France. Um, um, so these two papers have only recently came out in early 2022. Um, so this is the first report ever uh, to show that the phage proteins can actually interact with the host and uh, sperm, actually, and can uh, uh, meddle between the host reproduction system. To cause yeah, okay, effect. but but the paternal chromosome defects that you that have been seen during uh, spermatogenesis that's been re that's been reported before, is that what you're saying? The, you know the, the paternal chromosomes you're seeing in we you know that aren't aren't segregating to uh, to the poles. Yes, that have been reported that, a lot. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. The history report, I mean, in transition defects they are being shown for the first time. Okay, uh, so Tom Tom Wolf asks, is your system? Uh, is your system SYN A, SYN B, or SID A, SID B? Yeah. Or does it matter? Yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe you could maybe you could elaborate on that a little bit yes. for for, so, for the non aficionados because that's a pretty yeah, uh, so a pretty an aficionado question. Right. Uh, so people who don't know, uh, there is uh, also a debate in the field if it's uh, SIFs or they are SINs or they are SIGs. So. Um, Initially, they were all called SIFs, so cytoplasmic in incompatibility inducing factors, A and B, right? SIF A and SIF B. But then there were uh, more papers coming to um, uh, that elaborated the biochemical functions. So as I said, um, SIF from WML were never tested biochemically. Um, but so SIF A, oh, hold on, let me just uh, hold down. Okay, so stuff A, it has three domains, right? Carol is well, there is stuff, which is a domain of unknown function and STE, which is a um, sterile transcription factor. CIF B has PDD, EXK, dual domain uh, and a duct domain, which is a deubiquitination domain. So folks in, in early in 2018, 2017, they, it's actually Beckman uh, papers, they showed that CIF B from W pip, it has an active duct domain because he tested uh, the the active sites that were um, that were causing that were important for uh, causing ubiquitination of the genes of the substrate. Um, and he tested and he showed that and he he yes he showed that the the, the nucleus domains these two PDD EXK. In SID, in, in CIF B from WPIP, they were inactive because they don't have catalytic sites, as I mentioned earlier, but they were never tested. The Y type CIF B nucleus function was never tested. So, assuming that they don't have the active nucleus sites, they call that SID B. Okay. And then they looked at um, the CIF B from WNO, for example, which is a type 4 CIF B. And they showed that the nucleus catalytic active sites are there in these domains. And those CFPs, they are lacking in this domain, okay? So based on the active catalytic functions, they call SYNB. And if they have dub active and nucleus inactive, they call that SYNB, okay? So, and the CIFA is only called SYNA and SYN, uh, SYNA uh, in relevance of SYN, SYNB and SYNB. No catalytic function of CIF-A was tested before. Um, okay, so that's the background of SINs and SIDs. In our system, we always call them WML CIFs uh, because we uh, their dub is active too, and there is a nucleus domain. Even though they don't have catalytic sites, but we have now shown that they are catalytic that they are active nucleases. So we refrain to call them one or the other because 
phylogenetically speaking, they should be called SIFs, but then functionally, it's a little nuanced. The data is a little nuanced. Um, and the SIF A, interestingly, was never shown a nucleus before. It was shown, it was incubated together with SIF B in these papers from the other groups, um, showing that it doesn't do anything to SIF B's nucleus properties, but individual SIF A function was never tested. So we can always talk about that more in detail. There is a lot more to that. Uh, but yes, it does It does matter which WML or WPIP or W no WAU Wolbachia strain that you are talking about and what SIFs we are talking about. All right, great. Well, let me thank you for uh, for a great great webinar, uh, re really informative, and uh, so. But I, I learned a lot, and I'm sure the audience did as well. I'd like to thank the audience also for uh, for their uh, participation as well. So next week we will continue this webinar series. Uh, we'll have Brandon Cooper from the University of Montana speaking. And uh, we'll start at the same time. And I hope to uh, hope that all of you will join us uh, then for that webinar as well. So again, thank you, Rupinder. And with that, I'm going to close out this webinar. So thank you. Thanks a lot.